you know, this is one of those momentous shows where you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, where were you when? Where were you when the football lounge was officially hosted by two married dudes? That's right. Uh, you, you know, yeah. like, we were just young pups uh, a couple years ago <laughs> who were, you know, who were out there yeah. uh, in the world when this show started. Now we are mature men of the world with uh with the rings to with the rings to prove it it's a ring well, show it, it's a ring show that's it's right. a ring that's show right, baby. baby welcome <laughs> to the ring show uh it's really it's it's like a whole new it's just like episode one of 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 the football lounge it's a whole new lounge it's a relaunch of the lounge a, a relaunch if you will yes uh, we had to get rid show. of all of the strippers in the lounge now we started yeah, yeah, with with all gone so many strippers were in the lounge and now it's nothing but men. We uh, we we read the New York Times. We smoke pipes, uh, and uh, we do our shopping at Sam's Club, where we get eighty nine cent sodas. That's right. There you go. I love it. I love it. And some get that Coles <laughs> cash ready. Um, no, yeah, it's uh, very exciting. That's what we've been on the hiatus for two weeks now. Uh, as Grace and I got. Married and uh, went on her honeymoon in Italy, so ate a lot of great pasta, a lot of great pizza. And hey, for ESPN or any of those other platforms out there, we are both now very well versed in, in signing contracts. I think that's a big, <laughs> uh, a big plus in this now with the two married men. We both have put pen to paper. Uh, we, we understand have. how that goes, and so uh, that that will make it a more seamless uh, process. Uh, exactly. Whenever uh, this show needs to get picked up, so we're taking out calls, but. Yeah, no, had a, a fantastic time. Was uh was happy to have you out out here for the wedding. Great, was great weather, um, good times, good food, and then um, Italy was just fantastic. We did. I uh, will Rome. I will say about the wedding, and uh, it was yeah. an amazing night. But there were really, like you know, in hockey they do like the three. What do they do like after the game? Like the three stars of the game. The three stars. Yeah. And is it the third? The one with the three stars is the best, right? That's correct. Yeah. So. First star of the game uh, was uh, was Lolita Vasco. She was living. I mean, she this like this <laughs> woman is time. meant to be a mom at a wedding. Your mom is meant to be a wedding mom. Like <laughs> that's right. She got all her ducklings in a row. She's got all her family. She's got her kids. She's just managing everything. She was a star. She looked amazing. Uh, second star of the game, obviously the beautiful bride Grace looked amazing. She, uh, she was, it was obviously a very emotional day for many reasons for her. And she just was an absolute, uh, celebrity on, it out on, of the park. and she looked amazing. You're such a lucky guy. She was, she was gracious as ever and amazing, but the, honestly, the third, that this thing that deserved the three stars, the most Greenville, South Carolina, yeah, you guys, buddy. I, my wife and I left there just going to ourselves like, wait a minute, wait a minute. How are we like th this one of those where you're like, I have FOMO. Like I am, mi I am missing the Saturday morning, uh, farmer's market already. Um, yep. uh, it is, it is maybe one of the top places I've ever visited in the country. Where I'm just like, Oh, I want to live there so badly. You guys live in such an amazing little town, an amazing little place. And I'm, just, I'm beyond happy for you just for where you live. Yeah, no, it's extremely, uh, exciting, uh, to, to see the evolution of Greenville. And I've only been out here three and a half years and it's, it's grown since I've been here, but it was on its way up well, well before I got here. Uh, it is one of those uh, cities that it's not a large city. It's, you know, Charlotte's nearby. And obviously that takes the cake in the, in this portion of the Southeast, but Greenville has a lot to offer a lot of culture here. And beautiful. Um, there's just yeah. There's a lot of that really Main cool Street downtown area was like nothing I've seen in a in a town that size in my life. It was incredible. My wife and I were blown away. It's and, what Woodstock uh, has wanted to be. Woodstock, Illinois. That is. Oh my god! Uh, it's they, way. They I mean, it's so much more than that. It, it's yeah, it's, yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's uh, it's fantastic, and I'm a very. It's everything was beautiful. It was great, and uh, happy for you guys. But happy to be back. We're jumping into the fray, and we got so much to talk about. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to probably go into Italian a couple times throughout the show. Just, uh, you know, bear with me on that front. I've had to speak uh, a lot of it. And by a lot of it, I mean, just saying, you know, thank you. And uh, uh, over ciao. here, and where's the bathroom and ciao. And, and yeah, so uh, <laughs> and making pizzas and all of that stuff. But 
uh that that was a blast and now we're we're back i mean so much happened when i was over there in italy which oh, yeah. by the way i couldn't sleep one of the nights um i think i woke up at like 3 a.m grace was sound asleep and i was like man i can't fall asleep what do i do and then i remembered oh it's 3 a.m on a friday which means thursday night football is happening right now so <laughs> I, at three in the morning uh i i turned on the phone and got to watch some uh, thursday night football so that which was, game what a trip Steve? it was it was it was the uh was it the buccaneers bills oh right? bucks bills all right uh, it was not a good it, it was not a, an exciting game but uh hey you know it, it got the job done it helped put me back to sleep yeah and uh, i was able to finish out the night but uh, that was a trip, and so much has happened. We've got the the Raiders making big moves. We had the uh, the Rangers winning a World Series. We had yes. uh, well, just now the Cubs have uh, ditched David Ross and hired Greg Council. So, bravo for that. Thank you, thank you, Cubbies. Um, but yeah, just so much stuff. The trade deadline. Um, so we're going to touch on a lot of these things. Uh, but obviously, spending the the majority of this focusing on Week Nine and the happenings. Uh, that occurred just 24 hours ago. Some incredible uh, comeback performances uh, amidst, I would say, a lot of kind of dull games for the most part. Um, but we did have some in incredible performances, including C.J. Stroud just, um, you know, making his presence known on the scene if he hadn't already. So we dive into all of that and more coming up next. <music> For frequency's sake, has you covered on all things sports. From the squared circle to the hardwood and the gridiron to the speedway, we've got something for everyone. Walk down the aisle with the boys from Cards Subject to Change every Sunday as they take a deep dive into everything pro wrestling. Need your gambling fix? We've got you there. Enter Pit Row with Rod Villagomez and Fast Money as we win the checkered flag with NASCAR, Xfinity, and truck race winners and props. Football more your style? Explore the waters of NFL DFS with DFS Deep Dive with Brian Craighead and Jordan Kernan each week. More into the science portion of the game? We've got a double dose of action there. The Professor John Bush and Dennis Michelson take you into their science lab and dissect your week in the data lab. Want an analytical take? Nick Girl and the team at Gridiron AI come to you each week with The Lab. Need to know who to start last minute? The network's flagship show, for fantasy's sake, is here in a pinch. The fellows come to you live every football Sunday from 10 to 1130 Central with the week's best DFS, gambling, and lineup advice. And wrap up your Sundays with Joe Winkle and Nick Brinks as they come to you live with educated ignorance looking at all the day's action. Can't get enough of Joe? He comes to you three times a week. Not enough football on Sunday? Not a problem. Kick your feet up at lunch on Monday and slip on into the football lounge with Mark and Dan while they look at the week that was in news, notes, and more. For frequency's sake, you know what we mean. All right, we are back for some week nine shenanigans, uh, getting ready uh, for the Super Bowl plane update that's going to be coming up later on in the show. It's been a couple weeks now since Mark uh, officially launched uh, the Super Bowl plane for this season. So we're going to get the second iteration with some it's updates, not crowded. Mark. <laughs> it's not. No, no, no. We've we've thinned out a little bit, which there means is the that no one had to check nots. their luggage. Yeah, there are haves and have nots in the NFL. That's for sure. There are so that's a good call. I almost titled the uh, the show for this week the haves and the have nots because we are starting to see uh, some teams move in completely opposite directions and start to establish themselves ahead of the pack. Uh, of course, the San Francisco 49ers were one of those teams on a bye. We'll get to that later, but uh, you know that was a team that you know was starting to trend downward coming into this week, and then so Seattle had an opportunity. Uh, you had. Uh, other teams, the the Chiefs with a chance to, you know, kind of bounce back uh, quickly uh, off of a loss. And, you know, the the Bills with an opportunity to put their, uh, you know, stamp on the AFC East over the Bengals. So a lot of uh, big momentum shifts uh, on the table this past week, Mark. And we'll start with the Thursday night game as we always do and kind of rifle through these. Uh, as we have the last couple of shows, we are now in the meat and potatoes of the season, so we're not going to spend too much time on some of these matchups that don't have uh, as much on the line, the implications, and so forth. So uh, this game probably being one of those with the Titans at the Steelers and Thursday Night Football, I was able to catch that as I uh, recovered from jet lag uh, getting back from Italy. And so this game I was able to see in its entirety, and I think a lot of people were really intrigued by Will Levis seeing his four touchdown performance from the week before, 
got uh, how he would fare facing the Steelers defense. And while the Steelers came out with the 2016 win mark, I did think Will Levis was overall impressive in this oh, yeah. game. He made a lot of uh, throws off platform and uh, you, you'll have to forgive me. I forget who mentioned this uh, on, on one of the shows that I was watching or whatever, but when you try and compare these two quarterbacks together, Will Levis is a guy that can rely on his arm skills and talent to overcome mechanics. Whereas Kenny Pickett, I think it's pretty safe to say at this point now, we were about 20 game sample size, that he is a quarterback that if he's off platform, if he's not able to have his footing right and his mechanics sound, he doesn't have the arm talent necessarily to overcome that and make the throws that we've seen Will Levis do. And so while the Titans lost, my biggest takeaway outside of the Steelers still summing, uh, somehow managing to pull uh, the rabbit out of the hat in the fourth yeah. quarter was that Will Levis is the dude. And I, you know, I feel confident just two games in uh, that he's going to get plenty of runway here over the next year to really prove himself because uh, he's shown some special already. The most important thing the Titans can do from the remainder of the season, in my opinion, is to start Will Levis. Let him go through these growing pains for the rest of this year and figure out who you can pair with him, build around him. He's already creating a great relationship with Hopkins. Remember, they signed Hopkins to a three-year deal. So, it, yep. you know, like, it, it, like that is really, really important. And Levis is so much as a young player reminding me of Jay Cutler. And what we know with that is when you have a guy like that, where you have a ton of talent, one of the most important things you do with a guy like that is set a really strong culture. Vrabel can do that. And then you surround him with people who will take advantage of his explosive play-ness. When Jay was at his best is when he had Brandon Marshall, just big plays, throw it up, that type of receiver. Hopkins is like that. Creating that relationship with the young receiver Burks will be important in that realm as well. And letting him go through the growing pains. On a short week on the road, right? It was at Pittsburgh. Yep. He had a chance to win the game late. And Pittsburgh's really great defense, a top five defense, made him pay with a bad interception late. Let him learn. Let him go. There is no point in going back to Ryan Tannehill at this point in time. He has shown he deserves the snaps. He deserves the growing pains. On the flip side, for your Steelers, it is crazy. They are literally doing something we have never seen in our lifetimes of football. He, they are winning games in a way that hasn't been done in the NFL since the 40s, where they are being outgained, out uh, you know, outperformed. You know, they're still in a negative, I think, point differential and have a winning record. Um, it's impressive. And what I will say, not just that, they would have been, they should be. They were saying based on like the the yards and the overall points, zero oh and eight this yeah, year, and they're somehow five and three. And again, Mike Tomlin is a wizard. I mean, we know that about him. Mike Tomlin, though, it's going to be really imperative for him to take this with a grain of salt and make sure we we now know, I agree with you, we, we kind of get what Kenny Pickett can be. Kenny Pickett can be a guy who can be really successful in this league if you build an offense that supports him the way that the Dolphins have done with Tua, the way the Vikings did with Kirk Cousins, the way that the Niners are doing with Brock Purdy. He's in that category, which is a like Jared Goff with the Lions. It's a successful category. It's the majority of good starting quarterbacks in the league are in that category. Dak Prescott with the Cowboys. But the 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 Pittsburgh Steelers, the one thing that worries you, and I'm sure you feel this way too as a fan, but as just an outsider, is do they have the offensive mindset and the and the uh, ability to build an offense like that? because the Steelers are just so stuck in their ways. And if it's working and we're winning games, we're just going to build with defense. Kenny needs a system. He's got players. He's got talent. Fryermuth, Deontay Johnson, Pickens. That's a great starting block. An okay offensive line. They need help on the offensive line. But he needs a system to thrive in and, uh, I, and not just plays and players. So that's what I'd be w working towards building if I was the Pittsburgh Steelers. While also, hey, win games how you can win them right now. You're not paying Kenny anything. Yep. Spend money on that defense. Go out and get a couple elite offensive linemen and go out and get a, a offensive coordinator that wants to build a system because that's what Kenny Pickett needs.
Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a, a huge part in his growth and development over the next couple of years in, in his career, because as we've uh, you know heard many pundits say, the Steelers are not going to be moving off of Kenny Pickett, at, at least through his rookie contract and that probably yeah. that 50-year option too. So yeah, you got to start to do, I mean, I will say uh, them changing things up with Matt Canada, putting him on the sidelines for the first time in his career. He called plays from the booth his entire career in college and in the pros. Um, it, you know, and maybe it is a coincidence. He called the best game that I think we've seen uh, him call, at least at the professional level. And uh, maybe there is something to that, having the ability to communicate yeah. with your young quarterback on the sidelines outside of that 20 second window that you're allowed to talk to them in their helmet. I think that's a big, uh, big advantage, uh, obviously, um, right there on the field in the moment. And then, you know, just to kind of put a bow on it, because uh, you uh, tweeted at me during the game or maybe right as it ended, you know, is this sustainable? Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I jokingly put the John Candy uh, gif with the, oh, sure, sure, sure. But obviously it's not. And that's where it's concerning is that, you know, they are five and three. That's a great spot to be. I, you know, if you told me this is how they've been playing offensively all season long, I would take five and three all day. So with the Green Bay on tap next week, they yeah. still have to play the Colts. You know, uh, they get the Seahawks who are looking a lot of winnable uh, you know, games, worse and worse. So there's there is a lot of opportunity here still to get to 10 and seven this season. And so um, and and right now, all the teams in the AFC North, Mark. In the playoffs, in the playoffs, which is crazy, you know, crazy. It's crazy. They are the most competitive division right now in football. So the Steelers just need to keep staying um, above water, and we'll see what happens next week uh, as they take on Green Bay. If they can kind of start to stack here with the other teams, especially Cincinnati, um, breathing down their necks. So we'll get to Sunday now. First game in Frankfurt, Germany. First regular what a game. season game. Uh, over there in Germany in NFL history, the Dolphins at the Chiefs, which was very highly touted game coming into this, the the most uh, anticipated one of the weekend slate. The Chiefs edge Miami twenty one to fourteen in this game, a lot more low scoring than I think most of us would have yeah. thought. But it did feel that the Chiefs really did kind of have a stranglehold on this one, especially in the second half, despite it being so close. Um, it was one of those games where you felt comfortable. Uh, in that second half with how the Chiefs were playing defense. And obviously, what was it? The uh, the fumble recovery touchdown completely flipped the script. And, and kind of from there, it was difficult for Miami to find any footing. Um, but that just goes to show that Kansas City can win in a lot of different ways because their defense was, you know, pretty dominant there in the fourth quarter, especially. Um, but, you know, Kansas City, 21 points in the first half, and they didn't score in the second half, but they were so dominant uh, defensively that they were able to kind of, uh, you know, keep the Dolphins at bay. And if Kansas City gets up on you, it feels like it's over, even if it's not. Yeah, I will say this. Um, I'm stealing this from Trey Wingo. He tweeted this out. Trey Wingo, remember him? Um, I do. This is a, I, I think this is a really valid point that he made, and that's why I, I wanted to share it with our listeners. He says the Chiefs offense is broken. They scored only 14 points that game. Remember, the other came off the scoop and score. Yeah. They've scored under 24 points six times this season. One of the times they scored over 24 points was putting up a million points on the Bears in front of Taylor Swift. So, that I mean, take that with what you will. So, really, in seven of their games, they've been offensively just challenged. Yeah, now that's true. But their defense Comparatively, is so good, it hasn't mattered. They're still the number one seed in the AFC. So, uh, right. yeah, I mean, if I'm a Chiefs fan this morning, uh, I, I'm very thankful this game played out the way it is. They are the first team to win overseas this season while having less time in that country. Mike McDaniel got the Dolphins there early in the week. I think they were there Monday. Chiefs didn't get there till Thursday late. They only had one walkthrough on Friday, and then they played that game. So... This Chiefs team has been just kind of like towing that line all season long. And I still think the most important thing for this Chiefs team to do is to set a wide receiver rotation. Like they're throwing out like six, seven guys. And I just think they need to clean it up. It needs to be they Rice. can't figure out who to, yeah. Uh, it needs to be Rice, out. Valdez, Scantley, you know, Miko Hartman, and then one other guy. And it's like, that's it. And this is, and we're done. 
like the sky more loony, like all these things that just not working Tooney, excuse me. They're just not, it's just not working. So just figure out that rotation, build that chemistry and roll with it that they need. Now they still have a, a bye week coming on up. So like they, like, I think they'll, I'm not panicking yet, but the chiefs just don't feel still like a hundred percent. And maybe you can flip on the flip side and say, that's a good thing because they're winning games. They're not a hundred percent. But eventually it's like, when are they going to figure this out? And should I be concerned? Especially when you see what the offense is like the, the Bengals coming alive, the Ravens are a juggernaut right now. And Lamar's not even playing great because they're just running the ball down people's throats. So that's got to be a little bit of a concern for Miami. It's a simple, it's a simple thing with Miami. They got to show us they can beat one good team. If they can beat one good team, then I'll start to believe in them as a chance to, to really compete for a Super Bowl. But right now they are stuck in that they will make the playoffs. They might even win a playoff game, but they're not a real threat until they show us they could beat at least one good team. Yeah, that's interesting because I I didn't even put that together and realize that they're all of their wins have come against teams Miami, that are so this uh, under is, 500 this yeah, year. Yeah, here's the thing on Miami. This was Barstool Sports that tweeted this out as soon as the game ended. The 2023 Dolphins are 6 and 0 versus teams with losing records, 0 and 3 versus teams with winning records. So as simple yeah. as that. So and then I, if again, you look at who they have coming up, the Jets have winning record, the Titans uh have a winning record, the Cowboys, the Ravens, the Bills. Like that's you got so five they have games a chance. up here. They have a chance to to put some real wins together to to show us hey they are for real. But uh, the Titans as of, don't have a winning record. I don't know what I'm talking about. But but as of right now, yeah. as of right now, they are. I mean, they are, they are the like the Vikings of last year. They're going to make the playoffs, yeah. but I don't trust them in the playoffs as of right now. Yeah, they're a, 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 a strange team to kind of figure out because they have looked so on point and so good uh, in in a lot of their games. And I mean, kudos to them. They played the Chiefs within seven points. It shows that yeah. they can. They you know if this was a playoff matchup that they would you know, be able to go toe to toe with them. And they did with the bills earlier this season as well. Um, before the, before the bills actually just blew it wide open. But, um, the point being is that Miami has the, the tools to get there and they're going to get healthy again. They're going to get Devon H yeah. and back, which is a huge spark for that running game. But, you know, now it looks like, um, Hill might be a little bit banged up and Waddle got hurt in the game. So, they, this is a team, and we mentioned this at the beginning of the season. If if one domino falls, like they're very, they they don't have the depth there to they overcome uh, injuries, so they're going to have to stay healthy the rest of the year, and that's a big if uh, for any team. But right now, that's that's kind of just they're six and three, and they need to start putting it together soon because of the schedule that's coming up. Uh, the Vikings go on the road at the Falcons, and. What a what a strange set of circumstances here. Josh Dobbs, the Josh Jobs game. What an incredible uh, moment for him. He gets traded from Arizona. We'll talk about that um, to try and help salvage the Viking season after they lose Kirk Cousins for the year. Josh Dobbs, former fifth round pick for the Steelers, was a third string quarterback in Pittsburgh for several years. Always liked him. He was awesome. Just never obviously would break through. He's like a rocket sign there. He is a rocket scientist, in in fact. So smart cat and uh, gets to Minnesota with, what, a day before the game or two days before the game, uh, goes through a couple walkthroughs, learns some of the plays, but they say, hey, we're going to start Jaron Hall, the rookie, and, and he was uh, playing he's going to well. be the dude. And he was playing fine, and then he gets hurt. And so Josh Jobs has to go in with jo not even knowing his teammates' names and he comes in and engineers an incredible comeback late in this game, uh, just on point. He's clearly got the leadership quality, and you know it's not unlike what we've seen from Taylor Heineke providing sparks. Yeah, he was obviously on the other sidelines in this game. Um, you know, Josh Jobs just has a little bit of that leadership and that X factor that that can pull out some of these wins. Uh, so you know, huge victory for them. And as you mentioned, you know, with the NFC North being in the state, it's it. I mean, the Vi this is a big win for the Vikings because they're five and four, and the way that you know the Lions are on a bye this week, so they they didn't have to worry about you know keeping pace with the Lions. They're now kind of right right in lockstep there, and um, they have a legit chance now in in a bad division. I mean, they're the seventh seed in the NFC playoffs. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. The seventh seed in the NFC is up for grabs. Who wants it? Is it going to be 
Minnesota, Washington, Atlanta, Tampa, maybe the maybe the Rams and the and the Packers. I mean, they're both alive. It seems like the Giants, the Bears, the Panthers, and the Cardinals have all been resigned to their fate at the bottom. So it's going to be this uh, that group of teams battling, and Minnesota's pulling away despite not having Justin Jefferson and now having lost Kirk Cousins. And so I, I will say this. I still believe Minnesota, the smartest thing they can do is as soon as Josh Dobbs loses a game for them, go back to Jaron Hall when he's healthy because that kid's got a little bit of spark. BYU, fifth rounder, mobile kid. I'd like to yep. see him play. I'd like to see him play because the Vikings, obviously, no matter what happens, if they make the playoffs or not, their goal is to be the find the quarterback of the future uh, to develop with your wide receivers. And um, you may be playing yourself out of a position to draft the quarterback in the top 10, but you have assets. You might be able to trade up like the, you know what I mean? Or who knows, maybe a Michael Penix falls to you in late in the, in the mid first round, something like that. So you got to do all your scouting on that. But I, I would say if I was, like I said, I'd want to see what Jaron all has to offer. Cause Dobbs is not the guy you know. Dobbs is the guy you might want to start your year with next year. If you draft a Michael Penix, you know what I mean? In the first round, but not necessarily go all in. But the Vikings are in the driver's seat, and they should be. They're the best of that teams right now. The Washington, Atlanta, Tampa, Green Bay, Rams. They're the best overall team, best coach. Kevin O'Connell, great job. For Atlanta, on the flip side, listen, Arthur Smith, I like Arthur Smith. And I think Arthur Smith, um, you know, he's got a, 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 tough, a tough gig because Atlanta is very much stuck in that we have talent, but we don't have the quarterback. We have the scheme but we don't have all the pieces on defense. But dude, I mean, he is taking a beating from his fan base. Where's the Bijan Robinson carries? Where is Kyle Pitts in this offense? Bijan is not getting touches at all. And is and if it's because he's uh, not ready, not playing, well, then you got to play him and show that to your fan base because you want to save your job and not protect your GM. If the GM made the wrong pick and the kid's not good and not ready to play or whatever it may be, I don't know, but it's just weird in Atlanta right now. And uh, they've already announced Taylor Heineke the starter going forward for the next week. I think that's probably still the good thing because you want to win games if you're Arthur Smith, but don't do it at the, at the, you know, chance of ruining your own reputation for like, do you hate B. John Robinson for some reason? Yeah, no, I know that's what we've seen from Bijan is that he's extremely, talented and has produced on the field so i don't i don't think Weird. it has anything to do with I, it, it's got to be something behind the scenes or maybe he's not you know practicing the fumble, way that they want you know what him I mean? to and it seemed like he yeah. ended up in the doghouse and it's weird yeah it, it is a little bit strange i i think i disagree with the vikings take because i think if you have an opportunity to win the division you still have to try and go do that and with that being in view josh Dobbs clearly gives you the best chance to do that and so I, I, I would I start Josh I, Dobbs and, and maybe you just give Jaron, maybe you give Jaron Hall uh, a better look because there's no Kirk Cousins there. Jaron Hall now gets second string reps in practice and you can still maybe get some looks. It's not the same. Uh, I was just but, saying as soon as he yeah. loses you that I'd ride this Josh Dobbs wave here because I think you just do that. But I, I mean, Jaron Hall was interesting. He was interesting yeah, he in this was. part of that he game was. and he's mobile and he's young. Um, but maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe they don't. They maybe they don't feel like they need to get that look. Like he's, they know he's not a quarterback of the future, anyways. If they go one and two, and the Lions win the next three or something like that, then maybe you could talk about like, okay, let's let's start Jaron Hall the rest of the way. He'll still get six games. Uh, you could get a good sample size out of that. But I, yeah, I think right now, while the the opportunity is there, uh, you got to seize it. Cardinals get shut out on the road after trading yeah, Josh Dobbs. Ugly. They're now one and eight on the Toon, season. Tooney. Um, the Browns Clayton had Toon. had Clayton Toon. Yeah. Deshaun Watson came back uh, after several weeks of, of dealing with that shoulder injury. And he looked pretty good in this game. But it was, of course, yet again, Cleveland's defense that stole the show. Uh, was it four turnovers? I believe they forced of Clayton They're nasty. Toon in this game. And they are opportunistic. They get after it. And at the end of the day, uh, it was that defense that that really stole the show. So, um, you know, two interceptions of Clayton Tune, 
Um, they also picked up a, a, a fumble um, as well. So it's uh, it's one of those situations where the Browns are kind of like the Steelers in a way that their defense is so dominant and their offense really hasn't put it together and figured it out. Yeah. Um, so they're both right in that wheelhouse, right? They're, the Browns are five and three. They're staying afloat. Steelers are five and three, staying afloat. And uh, and the Bengals uh, are right there at five and three as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, big win for Cleveland to, to get a shutout win, uh, to get maybe a little bit more confidence going for Deshaun because that's something that he needed. Yeah, that- uh, that they really needed him to have like a convincing performance out there, probably his best in a Browns uniform uh, so far. And so, you know, maybe that puts the wheels in motion for them. And for the Cardinals, it's, uh, you know, it's tank season. So I, I, that's, yeah, that's I, I say about that. Yeah, exactly right. Great win for Cleveland. Like disaster was on the horizon if Cleveland lost this game and Deshaun looked bad. So they avoided the disaster. And getting a win is is huge because you you can justify, hey, we blew out a team we're supposed to blow out at home. You're like all those, like they checked the boxes in the win, so that's great. Um, I will say Cleveland's defense is just disgusting. Miles Garrett is so, so good. good, he's and he's so much fun to watch. I mean, he is a, just an absolute different human being. He is built different. When they picked him number one overall versus like picking Baker Mayfield number one overall. They, they got it right with Miles Garrett. You pick the dude that doesn't look like any other dude, right? Like that's yeah, what a number yeah. one overall pick is supposed to be. And like Baker's the exact opposite of like that. Um, for the Cardinals, I will say they're in an interesting spot. They have the number one overall pick right now. But at this point in time, as an organization, Kyler Murray's going to be ready to go within the next week or two. I think Kyler's going to come back, and I think they just have to play him. Like you, you, you have to as an organization play him when he's healthy and he's ready. So it'll be very much Kyler and Justin Fields trying to win as many games as they can to save their jobs in their in their teams. Meanwhile, this kind of weird battle for the number one overall pick. Now the Giants are going to be in tank mode. So this tank race is going to get very interesting. The Panthers are trash, but the Bears have that pick anyway. So, um. Kyler, the best thing he can do is the same thing that the Justin Fields. They're in the same boat, Kyler and Justin Fields. You've got to put up good games, good numbers, and win games for your team to try and A, keep your job in your city, or B, make yourself the desired QB to trade for, for the Atlantas, for the, you know, for the Vikings, for the teams that will win enough games, but need a quarterback of the future. Think about Kyler Murray in Atlanta. That's really interesting. Think about Justin Fields in Minnesota. That's really interesting if it falls that way. I'm not saying it should or it would, but those are the storylines. Think about Justin Fields in Seattle. Like Those are the storylines you want to start creating if you're Justin Fields and you're Kyler Murray. Um, Like, hey, we want to win a lot of games. We want to be a starting quarterback and have a chance in this league you're, you're going to have to start doing that down the stretch here and maybe even staying with your teams, the best thing you can do. Yeah. Yeah. And who's to say that the Cardinals won't just take Marvin Harrison jr. First overall and stick with Kyler and get themselves a, if Kyler you know, plays well, consensus number one receiver, it's yeah. the same thing. The bears fans are saying, if the bears keep, if, if, if fields comes back and wins games and yet the Panthers end up with the number one pick, Maybe you just take, uh, you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. with the number one overall pick and you trade what other, you know, the other pick and yep. you build around fields. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the Packers get a much needed win as snapping their three game three game streak. streak. Yeah. 20 to three over the Rams. The Rams were without Matthew Stafford. Of course, it was Brett Rippon, the uh, uh, nephew just... of Mark Rippon, uh, who had that uh, uh, great uh, Super Bowl run with Washington back in the 90s. But, um, Jordan Love had one touchdown. He didn't make any, you know, costly mistakes. They were able to get Aaron Jones going on the ground a little bit in this game. Uh, Christian Watson, uh, there, there were a couple missed opportunities there in the receiving core uh, from Jordan. Just the connection still not uh, working great. But, you know, this was something that the Packers probably also wanted to get for Jordan Love as well. Just one of those um, at home uh, convincing wins that, kind of gets that confidence back up, but they're three and five. They're not making a run at this division. Um, So really it's just about building that confidence of Jordan love and seeing what they can get moving forward with him. And meanwhile, the Rams are now three and six mark 
Yeah. They're in a kind of troubling spot as well because they can't. They just couldn't afford Matt Stafford getting hurt, and and this time it was uh, what was it? It was a thumb injury, thumb. Now, right? So it's just more problems. Brutal for the up, Rams, unfortunately. Yeah. Because the Rams very much, if you watch this game, I mean, they were the better team for stretches, but offensively, they could not be consistent. So I truly believe this was a moment if, you know, just that injury happened the worst time for the Rams and Stafford to get a very winnable game for them. The Packers are not good. I mean, they're just, they're just not. Offensively, it is, it's ugly to watch. It's painful. I will give them credit. It felt like they said, you know what, we're going to just we're going to hand the ball off a ton and we're going to try to just chunk this out against a team that we should beat. And then Jordan love made like he does plays in the second half. He's just terrible in the first half, but he made some plays late in the game. He settled in um, Packers fans. Got it. They got to be realistic and, and they're in a troubling spot. The Packers feel a little bit like um, new England, where it's like you say to yourself, our quarterback it feels like it's not necessarily all their fault, but it also feels like the writing's on the wall. We've seen what Super Bowl level quarterbacking is for so long. And what we're seeing now is just not it. It's just not it. And Jordan Love feels to me a lot more along the lines of like, he's he feels less than Kenny Pickett. You know what I mean? And he even feels less than Bryce Young. And some of these guys who in like Tua, where it's like, oh no, if they have the system, he doesn't feel like he has any pop at all, like just zero pop at all. Yeah. Now I kind of, I've kind of likened him to EJ Manuel uh, from uh, yeah, from I mean, those things like a long time ago, just like uh, a very you know below average starting quarterback with some you know cap like big arm capabilities and a little bit of mobility there, but. Uh, at the end of the day, you, you know, like 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 we've said before, I mean, this is this is year one as a starter, but this is year uh, four in the NFL. So yeah, or year year three in the NFL. No, year She's, four. He's Joe. It Burr. is year I four. Mean, it is year four. So, I mean, you've had. There's been a lot of time to yeah uh, to get the mental aspect of the game intact, and that's you know a lot of times the biggest thing to overcome, and. But also just so, the pop. Like, yeah, there's no yeah. wow. There's no yeah. boom. Wow. Oh! I mean, CJ right. Stroud, five touchdowns that we'll talk about. I mean, like, that's boom. Wow. Holy smokes. Yeah. And at least for Kenny Pickett, you can say he's pulled off some incredible fourth quarter for comebacks. Mr. Fourth Quarter Comeback. Um, and they're yeah, winning so, games. Um, Jordan yeah. Love, Jordan Love has a lot of work to do down the down the stretch to 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 bolster the confidence for them to say, you know what, we're gonna give him, we're gonna pick up the fifth year option. We're going to roll with it and we'll see what he, we, you know, a full off season of confidence building and more building around him. But otherwise the Packers might be one of those sneaky teams in that veteran quarterback market where they might say Kyler Murray, you know what I mean? Get him a dynamic yeah, quarterback sure. uh, if they want to go down that route or something like that. Another team that is in need of a lot of work and a dynamic quarterback are the New England Patriots, who got outplayed. And yeah. they, I think the Commanders are the better team, to be quite they honest are. with you. Uh, they they are. won twenty to seventeen. Better quarterback. Washington did. Uh, they got a better quarterback. They're four and five on the season. New England falls to two and seven. This is kind of an unprecedented thing we're seeing with Bill Belichick here. It's brought up a lot of questions yet again of his, you know, tenure with Cleveland and. Uh, his lack of success without Tom Brady. And it's, you know, um, whether or not there's an actual correlation to be drawn there, it is a fact. And it, it's what we're seeing uh, so far uh, with this tenure with Mac Jones and company. And they got outplayed. The commanders are that tough, gritty team that the Patriots want to be. And we thought maybe would be going into this year. But I think, Mark, as both of us kind of said, they were probably going to be the best of the fourth place teams in their division. Unfortunately, that's clearly not the case. Yeah, it's not the case. Season. You know, I, let, let's just let's call a spade a spade. Two things. There was a the, the, the Washington commanders were the trade deadline story. They went into we're tanking. We got rid of sweat. We got rid of of Chase Young. But what they didn't do is get rid of offensive players. They clearly yeah. feel like Sam Howell is the guy and worth building around. And I absolutely agree with them at this point in time. I'm shocked. I mean, you know, I predicted them to be a, a bad team this year. And they've been anything but like 
like bad, bad. They they have been hovering above the pathetic. They're, they're not the Giants. They're not the Bears. They're not the Panthers. And a win like this, separating them from New England even, you feel good if you're a Commanders fan in the sense that you have some really nice pieces. It's just unsure of what the organization should do. At this moment in time, it, to me, it feels like they should move on from Ron Rivera. They should advance the enemy to the head coach. And now they should use some draft capital to bolster that offense and go all in on Sam Howell offensive skill guys and and build the defense on the fly uh, as far as the future, it looks like, for Washington. That's what I feel like. And this win, to me, aids in that. Like, the enemy is clearly added and is building confidence with Howell, and Howell is playing at a very nice level, and you see some pop with Sam Howell. For the for the New England Patriots, they're in, they're like the they're the Green Bay Packers right now. They're just stuck. They just it feels like they don't know which way is up. They don't know which way to go. They don't have a lot of skill around their guys. They don't have a lot of A players that you're like, boom, that's a game changing player on either side of the ball. And their quarterback is very much meh. And when you're stuck in meh with quarterback land without a great system. And without great talent around them, you're you're gonna you're gonna be very much a, a three of a two win team through eight weeks. That's what it feels like right now for them. Uh, and they're looking up at a great quarterback in Josh Allen, a quarterback in a great system in Tua, um, and a and a team in the Jets that have a true identity and some real A players. So they're they're very much dead last fourth place struggling. And I don't know where to go if you're New England. Yeah, if Washington keeps this going and has success the rest of the year and gets to, you know, I predicted them to go seven and 10. I think they might even, might go eight, nine, or, uh, you know, even even push potentially for a nine and eight. If, I mean, if they have a lot of success. They see uh, growth and improvement from Sam Howell. You'd be hard pressed to say that maybe they shouldn't run it back with Ron Rivera, but they should promote Eric Bieniemy and not lose him. You know, yeah, there's a, I, I, I think there's a, a possibility where because Eric Bieniemy is going to get calls again this offseason. So if you feel that he developed a good relationship with Sam Howell and you felt confident in this offense, that's something you don't want to lose. And, you know, if I if it were me, I would say, you know, Ron, thanks for your service. We're promoting Eric. He's going to be the new head coach. And um, and and we'll we'll move on from there. Um, it's just like Ron Rivera. It's not he, he's not. Uh, a guy that you know is gonna get at this point in his career a team to a Super Bowl it doesn't feel like you know yeah so, agreed um the Bears go on the road at the Saints and this was kind of a brutal game because I thought Tyson uh they had a chance Tyson looked really good early in this game especially in the first half um and they had an opportunity uh you know Cole Komet had had a big game in this one uh they were they were tied there uh going into the fourth quarter and uh unfortunately the Bears uh, let the Saints uh, get the game-winning touchdown, and the rest is history. Twenty-four to seventeen win as the Bears fall to two and seven. Saints, yeah, five and four, still on top of the NFC South. There, uh, so an interesting, you know, situation for both teams because they're they are two teams that we don't think are very good, but one of those not very good teams uh, is still leading their division because of how poor it is, uh, and the other is staring down a race for that number one overall pick. With uh, with Justin Fields uh, possibly returning soon, but uh, yeah, very interesting dichotomy between those two teams. But a win that the Bears should have had, and again, I feel like this is more of an indictment on Eberflus when they're not able to pull out these games that are very close. Need the defense to step up and get that stop, and they don't end up doing it. And that's on Eberflus. I'll start with New Orleans and just say they are New Orleans is perfectly like average. I mean, they are yeah, they are the they epitome are. of like middle of the pack NFL team. And I say that in a good and a bad way they have. I mean, Jordan stepped up in the very end to make the big plays to help seal that victory. They have guys on defense. And then offensively, when Derek Carr has protection, like he did against the bears and he didn't get pressured enough, he'll dink, he'll dime, he'll, he'll be accurate and he will lead you to a victory at home. Um, but the bears had five turnovers to none for the saints yeah. And they were within one score. So the Saints, the Saints aren't exactly world beaters, but they should still win that division. They feel like they will they find a way to win that division. Um and 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 the Saints are 
to me, they are another really incredible defensive playmaker away and a, and a, um, to me, just like a tweak or two on the offensive line away from being a team that with their car can be like, oh, okay, now they're a, now they could be more of a contender in the a- NFC. They could win a playoff game. Like, yeah. I don't think the Saints should blow it up by any means, depending on how the rest of the season goes. But they feel like they're going to win this division. But if they make a couple tweaks in the offseason, they could actually be a real, like, moving in the right direction type of, like, type of team. On the flip side for the Bears, again, I don't want to waste too much time. I think the I'll, I'll say this. Let's start with Montez Sweat, right? Um, yep. I think now that they got the deal done, they're paying Sweat just below the top five guys. And I think Sweat is and belongs in that category of just below the top five guys. He's a very, very good player. I think he is a B-plus player. He is a guy, what do I always say about the Bears? You need more A and B players. Like that, that's how you win in the NFL. Like you need A and B players. I don't love trading a second round pick, but the Bears see the writing on the wall. Like you have two top 10 picks, you had a second rounder, and then you have some thirds and fourths. If you can say to it, what Ryan Poles did is he looked in the mirror and said, I can add a guaranteed B plus player in his prime. Um, and I have then the rights to lock him up to a deal. And this is what you got to pay edge rushers. And they didn't yep. significantly overpay. It's not like you paid him more than Joey Bosa. No, you're paying him just below those guys. You trade a second rounder for the right to get him. And then what's great is it frees up the tag, the transition tag for the Jalen Johnsons and the other players to lock up your good players you have. So, That is great. And it also allows the Bears to say on draft day, hey, we can take a wide receiver and an offensive lineman with our top 10 picks because we got Montez Sweat, right? And so um, I really, really, really like that. I love, I like that. Um, I don't think the Bears are done dealing. They still have, the Bears still have the most cap space. So I think the Bears will still be very aggressive uh, in the free agency market. I also think the Bears will have a little bit more now. I think this puts Eberflus' seat even hotter because now it's like, hey, listen, we got you someone to play with. You're the defensive play caller. You're the head coach. You're the defense guy. We got you someone to play with, and did you or did you not get the production out of of him in the second half of the season? So I like all those things. Secondly, as far as the game goes, Tyson Badgett. Well, real quick, just to compare with the Montez Sweat thing, are you more upset that Chase Young went for no, a no, no. even less? I didn't want price? Chase Young. I didn't want Chase Young. Okay. I, I just didn't. Like Chase Young is a little more of a diva. Chase Young is injury prone. Chase Young is the higher ceiling, but way lower floor. I don't want to pay those guys. I want to pay guys like Montez Sweat, who will be a part of my team for four years. And he yeah. will be. Because he's capable of being a part of your team for four years. Chase Young isn't. He's just not. Um, so no, no, I'm 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 I was never on Chase Young. If you could have got Chase Young for a fourth round or something, sure, right? Uh, and yeah. if the Bears were in the spot where they were four and four, and you're looking for we just want to get a pop and try to win more games, then sure. But Montez Sweat is a building block player for your organization. And you you traded a second rounder for the rights to sign him, and now he's not going anywhere. He is your part of your organization for four years, and I love that. Um, for, as far as the actual game goes, this is the biggest thing for me, and, and, and I've been saying it. I'll keep saying it on Twitter. I love that Tyson Badgett is your backup quarterback. Like, yeah, he's, you he's found really a backup that. quarterback. Like, that's great. Like, that is a great, great thing because he can be your backup if you draft you know, uh, at a quarterback in the top picks. And he's clearly really capable of being Justin Fields backup, winning you one game, losing you two. And Justin Fields comes back and now plays what you want from your backup quarterback in the NFL. Is he similar enough to your starter Badgett is, and he's similar enough to, and he's good enough to win you one of the two or three games that your quarterback's going to miss. If your starting quarterback misses four or more games, well, then your season's pretty much lost anyways, right? Like, that's NF- that's life in the NFL. So, Badgen is a, is a solid, perfect backup quarterback that you don't have to pay literally anything for, and I love that you found him. 
And I think you pair him with Justin Fields as the backup to Justin Fields as long as he's there or the backup to whoever else you draft as long as that kid's there. So I'm happy about that, but it is time to play Justin Fields as soon as he's healthy to play. He's got to play. It's Justin Fields' team. And so that's where I stand on on all that. I'm still with you. I'm out on Eberflus. I've been out on Eberflus since about week three. I'm ready. I'm ready for a new coaching staff. I would love personally a Ben Johnson or a Jim Harbaugh with a uh, with Justin Fields. That's where I still stand. And using the top picks to draft top players or to trade to get more picks and not draft a quarterback. That's where I'm at. Um, but that's you know that's life as a Bears fan. It's just a, a on Twitter. It's a nightmare right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it is pretty brutal and unfortunate all the same. But Justin Fields should be back sooner rather than later, and uh, we can get that ball rolling once again. The Seahawks came into this game against Baltimore five and two. Oh. They're five and three now after a brutal loss. They looked really bad, and Baltimore looked really good uh, in this game. Thirty-seven to three was the final there for Lamar Jackson and company. And while he didn't get a, a touchdown through the air or anything like that, uh, he he looked very competent and capable. The run game was really good. They started to get other people involved, like um, you know OBJ. Mark Andrews had a big game, so they were. Yep. They're starting to put things together as a unit and finding out that they can win in, in a multitude of ways, which is uh, you know something that you need to have in the NFL if you want to be able to make it all the way to the Super Bowl. Um, they are now being talked about as the top contender. They're 7-2. and two. They're in the two seed. Uh, they're right there behind Kansas City. So an opportunity is there for Baltimore to keep getting better. And they're a game and a half in the lead for the AFC North. So they need to keep winning to, to maintain... Uh, this confidence and and to stay afloat there in the division. But uh, I certainly think that they're uh, the second best team in the AFC right now. And, um, and, and there's a lot to be said for that. They're finding ways and Keaton Mitchell, their rookie running back showed a lot of sparks. So maybe he's the guy now moving forward after JK Dobbins got hurt yet again, going into the season. Um, But yeah, for Seattle, I think it's time to start worrying. Uh, We haven't seen at all this season, the Geno Smith that we saw last year, but we're like, okay, that's all right. They have Kenneth Walker. They still have, you know, guy playmakers and Geno's not going to kill you. Uh, but to be able to only put up three points, uh, yes, Baltimore's got a really good defense, but the entire offense looked completely out of sync. Uh, no run game whatsoever for Seattle in this one. And uh, and and I am starting to get concerned. You know, the last couple of weeks I missed, obviously, a football. I didn't get to see all of the football, but it, it does appear that the Seahawks are starting to trend in a, a negative direction, even among, among some wins. Yeah, I wouldn't panic too much on Seattle because, again, our expectations of Seattle this year were borderline playoffs, and I, I think right now they're they're still very much alive for that. Six, seven seed. Yeah, they are. And what I will say about Seattle is I agree with you. The Geno, we're, we're just at the point with Geno now where it's like, all right, this team has talent. Walker, those three receivers, that defense is improving and now it's just like okay, the, the, it's it's time for it Seattle. It was fun while it lasted. Yeah, it's time for Seattle to really get serious about what are we doing at quarterback. Whether that is Kirk Cousins next year, whether that's you know getting aggressive for a a, a rookie, a guy who's you know maybe his team's moving on from like a Kyler or a Justin Fields, whatever that might be, or maybe it's a rookie because you now have a lot of pieces, and now you got to find someone who's a little bit more consistently dynamic at quarterback. For uh, the Baltimore Ravens, I mean, what else is there to say? They are a juggernaut right now. They are playing the best football right now in the NFL, and Lamar is not even having to play it at an MVP level. That defense yeah. is nasty. It's just it's just vicious, and that run game is coming alive. That offensive line is very, very good. Mark Andrews is very, very good. And um, I will just say this. If the Baltimore Ravens, are not playing in the AFC North, they're going to be hard to beat. The AFC North is eating itself alive, and all these teams can beat each other. But when well, they if you think other- about it, too, we've talked about how dominant these defenses are. The three best defenses in the league are in the AFC North. And and I mean, Cincinnati's they're- defense is also a good defense. They're good. They're yeah, just, they're good. Comparatively, they're, they're not. Um, yeah. So I, I'll say this. I mean, yeah, we'll get to the Super Bowl playing here towards it coming on up here, but uh, the Ravens are, are very, very legit. The Bucks at the Texans, and this was the you know C.J. Stroud heroics in this game. I mean, he's the he's going to be the dude. We've already seen enough. He's one of those you know instances where 
Uh, it's like uh, it's enough, like Justin Herbert. Like we just yeah, seen it. Just saw enough performances uh, with Splash, and um, you know, week after week, he's been uh, you know bucking the trend of the quarterbacks who throw thirty five plus times a game as a rookie are not going to have success. Well, he's he's the opposite. He's a guy that can throw forty times a game and still somehow get it done. He had four hundred seventy yards passing, a rookie record in the NFL in this game. Five touchdowns as well. Uh, just an incredible display after the Buccaneers, you know, back and forth in the fourth quarter. It looked like Baker Mayfield was going to get them the, the game winner. Yeah. And then CJ Stroud comes back and and wins the game for them in, in epic fashion. So, yeah, the Bucs aren't a very good team, but neither are the Texans. And CJ Stroud has been the biggest reason to all four of their victories this year. They're probably not going to end the year with the winning record, though. The, but at this rate, maybe eight, nine. Um, maybe a floor of seven and 10. Uh, but either way, he's the reason for every single one of those wins. And that as a young coach, uh, that as a, you know, rebuilding franchise got, has to give you all of the, you know, hope in the world and, and the positive vibes there in Houston that they've got the right dude and they're moving in the right direction. The I, I tweeted it out. And so I want to address it right away. The difference between Bryce Young and CJ Stroud right now, uh, it's not, you can say, oh, the talent around them. Yes, Bryce Young has nothing to work with right now. And we've said it over and over and over again. Bryce Young is Tua. You need to build a system around him, and you need to, to get him players that fit in that system, and and um, he will succeed. I think he can play at this level and play and put up good numbers and be a very, very solid starting quarterback if you develop it that way. C.J. Stroud, we both said it. Uh, he was our number one guy on the board because the size, the arm strength, and we're seeing it right now. He is making players better around him. Even Herbert, when he started and showed up in the league, he had Keenan Allen. You know, he had Williams. He had Austin Eckler. Stroud has no one. I mean, like, no-name guys. Like, no-name guys, and he's turning them into and a defensive head coach. I think there's two things that the Texans have done well. D'Amico Ryans was absolutely the right head coach. He's reminding you a lot of Mike Vrabel. Culture, system, accountability, and he immediately brought that as a, as a first-time head coach. Him and Vrabel, boom, in the same division. And what you're seeing with him is it's just, it's just talent. I mean, it's just big, strong, laser arm, sees, reads the field. And that offensive line is pretty darn good. They're giving him time. CJ Stroud is that guy and um Tex and Panthers fans had to be sick to your stomach. And the, all the accounts, the count is that it was the coach and the GM really in, in Carolina really wanted CJ Stroud. And it was the owner, Tepper, who's like, give me Bryce Young. When you draft a quarterback number one overall, size, arm strength, just that dude, it matters. And um, I think. I really do think we're going to see a, a little bit of a hold on this kind of just like smaller, undersized guys. And I think it will help Drake May's stock. I think CJ Stroud is helping Drake May's stock and hurting Caleb Williams' stock. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do want to point this out because I saw this right before we uh, logged on for the show today. Uh, because I saw all of those reports as well about the disconnect between David Tepper, the owner, and Frank Reich and uh, Scott Fitterer. Um, but Steve Reed of the AP, who um, you know I trust, I've, I've worked with him in the past, um, and, and he's a good dude. He's been covering the Panthers a long time. He is saying that that is inaccurate. He's saying that the fact is that they, all three were on the same page and all three wanted Young going into it. So – I, we will never know probably yeah. exactly what the truth is. Um, but you know, I, I trust Steve Reed. And so, um, we'll see, you know, maybe, maybe that's, that's the case, but regardless, then the question is why, you know, why at the end of the day, are we getting caught up in, in all of these things when it did appear to us layman that CJ Stroud was the best one. And we, we even said Will Levis was our number two, and so we both far, said Levis was two. It's looking like it, it might be shaping up, and and we don't. It's very hard to get quarterbacks right, and, and we have so many predictions that go wrong. Uh, but this was one of those unique opportunities where we may have gotten the exact one, two, three order correct for this quarterback class, and so I think we should pat ourselves on the back 
a little uh, bit for that it's one. early yeah. it's early but it yeah. feels good and i and i just i'm happy for texans fans they i mean stroud is and D'Amico ryan's is a heck of a combo i would i would be very very happy if that was my quarterback coach combo of chicago bears going forward unfortunately uh it is not yeah we can breeze past the next two here the colts 27 yeah. panthers 13 both teams uh not doing well uh but you know obviously the colts are just more talented than the panthers right now carolina is one and seven so hooray bears and uh, the colts are four and five so they are they're putting together some wins here as well they're doing a little bit better than even i thought they would be um especially with gardner Minshew at the helm but uh, Jonathan Taylor getting him back. They're getting Michael Pittman more involved. So they have the playmakers the Colts do. They always had the roster. Yeah, Colts uh, are feisty. For putting it together. So, yeah, it's unfortunate that they can't be seeing all of this with Anthony Richardson. They're going to have to wait till next year for that. Anything you want to talk to uh, about this particular game before we move on? No, I, I will just say this. My one concern with Carolina is that, like, you know, I, I wanted them to be more aggressive at the trade deadline. Like, I said it. Like, you need to start bringing in people that are going to grow with this young quarterback, and they haven't done that. And um, I think they're going to have to have a very big, important offseason. And at this point in time, you, you are just clutching at your pearls and crossing your fingers that, that this kid makes it through the rest of the season healthy because you do not want him to tear or do something to require a surgery to where he's going to miss offseason development because he and the coaching staff and this organization needs it. So please, 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 please continue to protect that investment if you're the Carolina Panthers. Absolutely. No, you got to do that. Um, you're, you're all in. You're, you're tied, and, and so you do have to do your best to protect that asset. Uh, the Giants fall to the Raiders, who were obviously very emotional coming off of the firing of Josh McDaniels, interim head coach Antonio Pierce, the former New York Giant himself, uh, stepped up to the plate. Seemed to rally the troops, and uh, they had the rookie Aiden O'Connell starting in place of Jimmy Garoppolo, who was benched after the firing of Josh McDaniels. A whirlwind going on in Vegas. So we'll, that's probably what we want to focus on here in the game because obviously the Giants just are not a good football team. Daniel Jones got hurt again, so they're pretty much done. The Raiders also not a good football team, but uh, an emotional victory for them. 30 to six in convincing fashion. And it appears that at least they'll have an opportunity to see what Antonio Pierce has to offer as a head coach before making their decision on who's going to lead the helm next season, because this has just been a revolving door over the last 15 years. And I believe there was a stat. I, I don't know the exact number, so I'm just going to throw this out um, as a, uh, you know, a paraphrasing, but I believe they were saying that the last uh 15 head coaches for the Raiders have not lasted more than two years. That's pretty, pretty brutal uh, dating back to, you know, the it's the one of the worst jobs 90s. in sports. It's one of the worst jobs yeah. to have in sports. I will say though, I, I think they did the right thing in firing him. Yeah, they, they had to do it. Yeah. And, which is just awful. Cause again, it's just bad signing and the Raiders are in a flux. I, I fully expect the Raiders to this like oomph of the Antonio Pierce interim thing to, to fizzle quickly. Uh, to come back down to earth. And and a lot of it is the Giants are officially on number one pick watch. Like, I mean, they are bad. They traded Leonard Williams. They have lost Daniel Jones. They don't have Tyrod Taylor for the next three games. It's bad. Like, it's bad. And it'll be really fascinating to see what happens at the end of the year if the Giants end up with the number one overall pick because you have yes. just committed a ton of money to Daniel Jones but he's not going to be ready to at least mid season next year. And he has been absolutely horrendous. How can they pass up if they get the number one pick on not taking a Drake may a Caleb Williams. And um, they are on absolutely the Giants should be on number one pick watch and their fans. If I was a giants fan, I would be rooting for the tank. Imagine Brian Dable yeah. with one of those young quarterbacks. You could justify it in a sense because you're not paying them much money. Exactly. And you, so you can maybe figure that out. So you're out. paying a lot of money at your quarterback position. Just think of it that way. Our quarterback yeah. position, we're paying a lot of money to, it just happens to be a rookie uh, that we're, you know, not paying the bulk of that portion to. And Hey, maybe they'll get, you know, if they, if they do make that decision, Mark, other teams see that and other teams who are desperate might say, Hey, what can we, can we work out a deal for Daniel Jones? Maybe the giants eat half the contract. 
and give up Daniel Jones we'll see. And, and save a little bit of money there. I just say but. the Giants are officially they're so, I mean they're bad bad. Like they're officially they're like with the Bears yeah. Yeah. and the and the Panthers like it is now officially number 1 pick watch for them. The last time a Raiders head coach Mark lasted over 3 seasons was Art Shell who went from 89 to 94. So 1994 was the last time they had a head coach that lasted more than three seasons. That's that's hard to do. It's one of the worst. That's really hard sports. to do, especially the when they had you know the, John Gruden in the early years when they were good. He didn't even last three years with them that first go around. So that's and that's and you know what brutal. Antonio Pierce and those guys like they're gonna get the job because they just can't. He cannot afford to pay anyone. Like he just can't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, all right, uh, the Cowboys at the Eagles. This was another highly anticipated game, one we expected the Eagles to win, I think, both of us. Uh, but it was a little bit closer. I'll give the Cowboys yeah, credit for that, that credit. they did battle hard. But at the end of the day, it ended up being, an, uh, you know, the Eagles that get the victory. They proved to eight and one. And just like the Chiefs we were talking about, right, they're not putting up the splash numbers that we've seen of them in the past. But similarly to Kansas City, they keep winning despite this. And they are now 8-1, and they're in the top of their conference. So Kansas City and Philadelphia, just like last year with the Super Bowl matchup and everything, they're having similar trajectories here in the 2023 NFL season. I think the Eagles are seeing a little bit more offense from them as of late uh, than Kansas City. But they're two very similar teams on that on that track. And, uh, yeah, the Cowboys, I mean, it's something that we've said all along. We're just not buying into it. And I will say... You got to throw this in Mike McCarthy's face because once again, it's like, hey, man, you were talking a, a big game about how Callan Moore was all about throwing it all over the place and you're getting yourselves into these turnovers and how you wanted to get back to running the football and being more efficient. Well, you're not more efficient. And red zone scoring last year, they were in the top three. This year, they're 31st. So yeah. we want to talk about efficiency metrics. Uh, Mike McCarthy needs to take some ownership and, and accountability. Uh, for you know how he handled that Kellen Moore uh, departure, and and you know the fact that this is his offense to run now. Yeah, the Cowboys. Listen, I mean they're just they're they're just a very okay team. They're an okay team. They have a big play receiver, uh, Dak. When he gets time and protection, can uh, can really move the ball on you. They, they can't have run the ball either. No, but they have yeah. an a- elite defender in Micah Parsons. Probably you know on any given Sunday, the best player on defense in the NFL. Uh, there's a handful of guys. He's in that, he's in that handful. And then, you know, overall, I will say this about Philly. One of the things we th- said with Philly last year was they were blowing teams out. Remember? And it was like, they're not really playing close games. Then Jalen hurts got hurt. And then they lost some games and he came back and it was like, Oh, yeah. this year they are w- winning wild games. They lost a physical game. They're winning blowouts. They're winning tight games. So I love that Philly, it feels like it's having a more traditional year for a Super Bowl team. Does that make sense? Where yes. they are winning a games they're supposed to win. They have they lost a game they're supposed to win. They're winning tight. They're winning ugly. They're winning blowouts. I think this team is finding a lot of confidence. I love Philly right now. Love, love, love Philly. And A.J. Brown, uh, yeah. uh, you know Devontae Smith. They are nasty. They're nasty with the weapons, and and Jalen Hurts is playing some really good football. Jalen Hurts is playing inspired football, and uh, that tush push continues to be so impressive. They I love the evolution. So of many the tush times push. a game. I love yeah. it too with the fakes, with the with the play action. Love it. Yep, yep. It's good stuff for sure. Um, all right, the final one Sunday night football. The Bengals pull out a twenty four to eighteen victory over the Bills, despite that close score. I felt like the Bengals were in control most of this game. And I'm once I'm still feeling good about my prediction with the Bills just kind of being yeah. at the ceiling that we've seen them and and not ever getting beyond that uh, over the hump, so to speak. And they're finding themselves in the tough position here at five and four. If they lose a, a, another game or two, that's going to be really tough sledding for them, considering the Jets are finding ways to win games somehow. The Miami Dolphins aren't going anywhere. And so your division's kind of being up for grabs that the AFC North continues to win the way they are. The wild card's going to be a tough thing to compete for. Buffalo should be, I'm I'm pretty concerned for Buffalo right now, to be honest. They're just not, they're way too reliant on Josh Allen. They have nothing else going for them. They can't run the football effectively. 
And unless the script works well for them, I don't trust them really from behind by no. more than more than a touchdown behind. I feel like it's over for Buffalo. If they're if they're behind 10, yikes. Yeah, I it's, which is crazy because Gabe Davis and um and Diggs are both big play receivers. Yeah. I, but yeah, you're are. right in the sense that Buffalo feels like they just call plays. They don't have a, a system, a formula, an identity. It's just calling plays. Where and and now that their defense is banged up so badly. Now I do like that they got Razul Douglas. I like that they were aggressive. They got a corner. They'll work him in. Problem is Buffalo. I heard. I think it was. Um, oh God, who was it? Someone on ESPN. Buffalo wants to play, and this is true. They want to play zone coverage. But I'm yeah. sorry, when you when you have to play man and they're beat up, like Joe Burrow picks apart zone coverage. Patrick Mahomes picks apart zone coverage. And they don't have the, – they're not healthy enough to play man-to-man against some of those great teams. So they're just – they're just at a loss, even though they have a really solid defense when healthy. They're at a loss in some of those moments. They need yeah. to have yeah. an offensive identity. They really do. And and I think I think there's a lot of good that can come of this for Buffalo in the long term that they might have to move on from their head coach. And if you are a Ben Johnson, if you are a uh, you know what I mean, a, a, a Jim Harbaugh, one of the top contending coaching candidates. Buffalo is going to be extremely attractive. Winnable sure. division with Josh Allen and those weapons, extremely, extremely attractive. Um, I will add, I think that's where you could start having those conversations. The seat is definitely warm, if not hot, for Sean McDermott right now. I will add, for the Bengals, to me right now, they are they have to be looked at as in the big three of the AFC. I know their record might show it, not show it, but again, they are over the last four weeks, they're playing as good a football as anyone. They're great. Yeah. And Joe Burrow's Joe playing Burrow, the best quarterback. Yeah. Joe Burrow has been the best quarterback in the NFL the last three weeks. And that's dangerous because the Bengals are the team that that you can uh, we can all confidently say anywhere, anytime, anyone, they'll put up a they'll put up a fight and they they will show up. And that's Joey Cool. That's Joey B. And um, they're fun to watch right now. They are really, really fun to watch. Things are clicking for them. I just don't know if they have the elite defense that the Chiefs and the Ravens do right now. But it may not matter because right now they have the guy playing best quarterback in the league. I will pose this question to you before we get to the Super Bowl plane. The Buffalo Bills currently are in are the nine seed. They're behind the New York Jets, yes. uh, who are the eight seed. If you were a betting man right now, like, do, does Buffalo get there by the end of the season? Keeping in yeah. mind that the rest of their – like, they do have I do, some, some easy games here. but then I they do have, think they get there you know, because they, I, I, I do think they get there because I think even though they, they have tougher games, I still think you're going to see some leveling out of the competition around them. I don't worry as much about the Browns. I don't worry as much about the Steelers. I think there's some coming back to earth for the teams ahead of them, the Jets versus Josh Allen is to me, Josh Allen is still, I'm going to rely on Josh Allen to get me there. The problem will be if they make it as a wild card team, um, the future of the, Buff like their ceiling is not high right now for Buffalo. It's just not Josh Allen is their ceiling and Josh Allen is a guy that needs a system. He's a guy that needs to design. Watch that the scripted plays for the first drive. They were amazing. The Bills came out, touchdown, touchdown. We thought this was going to be 34-33 uh, shootout, but then it fell apart for them because they don't have a system beyond that, and that is a huge problem for the coaching staff of the Buffalo Bills. It is. It is. And, uh, well, it's tough to have that sobering thought about Sean McDermott because he's been so good. Uh, but at the same time, it feels if, like they're not hit getting it. over it. Yeah. You just, you have to be able to move on and, and, you know, call a spade a spade when it gets to that point. All right. Drum roll for the Super Bowl plane, introducing the newest uh, edition here of Football Lounge Airways as we are 
Well, we've already taken off. I don't know where we're at. Uh, you, you can you we're can leaving, give us the, the coordinates here. Yeah, we're leaving Philadelphia for a quick stop over in uh, in uh, Pittsburgh. Okay? okay, just a quick good, transfer. So first class, again, if you're new to the football play, uh, to the Super Bowl play to the football lounge, first class is these are the only teams I believe that can actually win the Super Bowl today. Those are it. Ravens, Chiefs, uh, and Eagles. That's it. I mean, it's as simple as that. As of today, from what we've seen from resumes, quarterback play, coaching, if you're going to bet for a team to win a Super Bowl, those are the only three teams I'd put money on. Whoa, whoa, uh, business class, a business class. These are teams that absolutely can make a championship game. They can maybe make a Super Bowl even, but could they win a Super Bowl? As of right now, no. There's there's enough of a flaw they can't win a Super Bowl. For the Bengals, it's the defense. For the Jaguars, it's the youth, and it's um and it's just the inconsistency of the offensive line. And for the Lions, it is. I just. Don't know if they can overcome all of that bad juju in one year. Could they make a Super Bowl? It's possible because the NFC is so weak beyond the Eagles. But could they win a Super Bowl against any of those teams of first class? No, it, it, it just just no. That's interesting that the Lions are there. I might take some objection with that, but we'll get to your economy class list and then we can discuss. Well, again, the business class is they got to make it to an NFC championship. They got to make it to a championship yeah. game or further. And right now, I have more confidence in the Lions than any other team in the NFC beyond, the, except for the Eagles. Uh, and then, of course, uh, economy is these are teams that will make the playoffs, in my opinion, and they could even pop, win a game or two, but their absolute ceiling is the championship game. And even most likely, I don't see them necessarily in a championship game. Niners, uh, they're on a three-game skin, and they add young. So they have a lot of upside going into their next football game. Bills and Dolphins are tail spinning, but I will say I trust them more than teams like in the AFC, like a Steelers, uh, you know what I mean, like a Chargers, like a Jets. They have a leg up on those teams because of quarterback for the Bills and because of system and coaching for the Dolphins. Yeah, overall, I don't have an objection to the There's teams listed on No this plane. other teams in the NFC should be on the plane. Correct. So if you yeah, want to gripe about that. who should be ahead of who, I trust right now the Lions over the, over the Niners just barely, mainly mm. because of Jared Goff and the, and the consistency of the offensive line for the Lions. Gotcha. Yeah, see, that's the only one I would probably flip those to me personally. I still believe yeah, in the 49ers, but they have had a rough go. Uh, both of those teams were on the bye, so if we want to discuss the the bye teams real quick, yeah, really we, quick, we can do so. Um, you know, there were four teams on a bye this past week, and uh, those being the Detroit Lions, the San Francisco 49ers, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and the Denver Broncos. So and, and any thoughts on these teams that like, I, I thought the bye week came at, at a good and a bad time for the 49ers. They really needed to get back on. So like a win this week would be really nice to like, they got to stew yeah. on this for a little bit. They watched Seattle lose, which I guess helped them out a, a, a bit, but gave them an opportunity to move ahead of them. Uh, Detroit watches the Vikings make a comeback win. And that's kind of, you know, kind of sticks in your cross. So, but both these teams, the Lions and the 49ers, uh, you know, have an opportunity to not only get healthy, but come back and get wins and still stake their claim atop their divisions, uh, especially because of, you know, the lack of, of quality competition in those divisions. So I think those are big takeaways for those two teams. The Jaguars, um, you know, they a uh, 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 bye week to not just get healthy, but really another week to maybe try and figure out how we're going to spark uh, this offense because we haven't, I mean, I overall, I've been a little disappointed in what we've seen from yeah. Trevor Lawrence this year, Agreed. but again, they're winning games. So it's like, you can't be that disappointed. And he's very talented still. Um, but Calvin really like we got these two got to start, you know, getting that burrow chase kind of connection. Agreed. Um, and then the Broncos are just, they're the Broncos. I, I, I think all they, they just need to, to find some sort of, uh, 
some sort of chemistry somewhere. I I will say for each team, like, uh, yeah, quickly the Broncos, I think it came at the right time for them. They got to win. It's like now fly back under the radar. No yeah. one's trashing on you anytime soon. Can you focus in and come out with a tighter game plan, feel more comfortable and kind of push in the second half of the season? For the for the Jaguars, absolutely. It's a time for that offense to to regroup and to say, hey, what do we need to do to get on the page to be a little more explosive so we can score with the Baltimores, with the Cincinnati's, with the with the Chiefs of the world here as we're trying to compete with. For the for the Lions, I think the buy is a it came at a really good time. They had some nagging injuries, you know, get really healthy. And also they add a uh, you know, wide receiver at the trade deadline, Peoples Jones, and say to yourself, what do we need to do here now with some really winnable games to just absolutely dominate this division down the stretch, right? Take care of our division down the stretch. And I think they absolutely will. For the Niners, I think the buy came at a perfect time. You get to add Chase Young. You get to bring him in with the buy. You're on a skid. Part of the reason you're on a skid is because Debo's not healthy. Trent Williams isn't healthy. Yeah, um, get those guys back. Hey, hey, Brock Purdy, everything's okay. Settle in. Let's take a breath. So I think the buy came at a great time for the Niners. Yes, you're right. You want to get that bad taste out of your mouth. But I think this is a team that will be motivated from it. I expect big things from the Niners here in the second half. An all-in attitude, a refocused attitude with some tough games for the Niners coming on up. Uh, so uh, don't write them off. It's a lot. It's funny. That Super Bowl plane had, you know, three big teams that were on a bye. And yeah, so true, true. and so it was a weird noon slate of games, a lot of yuck. Uh, uh, we're already yeah. talking a lot about draft for a lot of teams, but there is a chunk of this team of this NFL right now. Arizona, Chicago, New York. Um, uh, that absolutely in the NFC, it's all about the draft. Panthers, you know what I mean? Like that's four teams. Yep. It, that's a whole division basically of teams in the NFC that's just out of it. And in the AFC, you know, you have a lot of teams that are just in that. Oh, what are we battling for? And then teams like the Colts that just it, it the season's lost anyways. So there's a good chunk of this NFL right now that they're they're literally just playing it out. And it matters to a lot of guys for their jobs. But as far as Super Bowl playoffs, no. Yeah. 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 I think that's all fair and well said. So a lot of agreement there. Um, Good to be back. This has been fun. We're back. Yeah. Back on the airwaves. It's been great to, to get back in the flow of things. And uh, here we are going to the back half of the NFL season already. It flies by. It absolutely goes so fast. And um, so I'm looking forward to seeing you know, how this season progresses and, and some of the topics that we'll, we'll be able to, to forge on with moving forward. I will say in the next week or so, uh, one of these episodes will kind of start to look back on our early season, uh, preseason predictions yeah, and see kind of where we're, I did have uh, the Giants you know, with a better forward. record than the Cowboys. We can address that now. That was wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was, uh, that was inaccurate. Um, but I'm a Cowboys. There's there, <laughs> there is there. There's plenty to go around uh, where that's uh, concerned. So, yeah, this has been great. Uh, please, as always, follow us on uh, YouTube, social media at FB Lounge. Uh, you can you can check us out on on X and Instagram uh, threads everywhere that you uh, get your news and uh, sports commentary. If you are watching on YouTube, please uh, consider liking and subscribing. It really helps us out with the algorithm and uh, thanks again to our, uh, our sponsors for making this uh, a wonderful uh, podcast network here at the four frequency sake podcast network. And you can check out all of the other shows at four fantasy sake QC.com. But for Mark, I'm Dan and we'll see you back here next week. <laughs>